Hello, everybody. How are you? We are here in the classroom, a, engage, a, a, engaging a healthy mind, body, spirit. We're in that classroom. That's the classroom we're in. And so we started this classroom. Oh, did I stop counting those? I did on the Valentine's. I, I used to count them so many days out of so many days. I stopped counting that. So I don't know how many days ago we were just, we started the engaging a healthy mind, body, spirit, which is really a combo of the activities <clears throat> that we do in our minds and in our hearts. It's the, the knowledge we give ourselves to sort of help us change our hearts. But we have a lot of crossover with our DIY psychologist and that's because that's the behavior aspect of it. So if we come at anything, if you come at anything, and you really want to have a good idea of all its facets, no matter, no matter, think about it, a career, a career. You have to have Learn knowledge. That's why you go to school, right? But even before you learn the knowledge, you have to have a drive. And that drive in your heart has to take you all the way through. The drive has to get you started, but it also has to keep you going, doesn't it? So that's the heart part. But all of it is behavioral, isn't it? Right? You're all, all of it is going to school, taking the classes, reading the book, all of it's behavioral. So you think about those three things. And so that's the reason why I get them all confused. But you know what? <clears throat> I always feel like I am being led by a guiding light. Where's the music? Cue the music. Guiding light music. I don't even know what it is. Otherwise, I might hum it. You know the success I've had with doing that in front of the camera. Okay, so now we only have 45 minutes. That's because we get into this, you know, oh gosh, it's just such a, it is a heady class because it's a hearty class and it's a heady class. So it's a hearty class. Not so it is. And it is. Universities are heady classes. They're not hearty classes. You want to know why they're not hearty classes? Hearty. Because they've left out the heart. They've left out the spirit. And more and more, I'm watching the Travel Channel. Oh my gosh, this is all about it, this class, Engaging a Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit. I'm watching the Travel Channel on Pluto TV. Bravo, Pluto TV. Just bravo. I just, bravo, 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 right? So, and, and I know that there's probably some big names who are bringing it to us free, right? Like Tom Cruise is all over it. Harrison Ford's all over it. Sound, sounds to me that it, it probably has something to do with, you know, with that religion, whatever. Scientology. Isn't Harrison Ford in it too? Likely so. Somebody's got him by the cojones. For sure he's done some <laughs> questionable things. I, you know, I, I'm not saying he's broken the law at all. I'm just saying <laughs> somebody's... Somebody probably could, you know, bribe him on things that everyone knows about him anyway, or assumes anyway, whatever. All I'm saying is the faces I see a lot of on Pluto TV, and I'm happy to give them some kind of a acknowledgement because I really do enjoy that. And the travel channel, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, like nothing I've seen on any travel channel. I mean, even at, even with Anthony Bourdain or whatever his name is, his name was. Yeah, don't don't have your face show up again, cause mm -hmm, we I know you were dead. I know how it happened. Well, everyone knew it, so you can't. Your face can't all of a sudden show up like Dennis Miller's keeps dying and showing up, dying and showing up. What's up with that? Well, as long as you don't have a funeral within three days, good to go. Ah, hmm. So many traditions, so many traditions that really take 
hold, I don't know, in the head, probably from, a, it is, it gets, takes hold, here, we got top down theory and bottom up theory. It, does it take place, get hold in your head first, top down, some of that, bottom up, does it get a hold of you in your heart, in your senses, does it make you aroused in some way, right? Doesn't always have to be a perverted arousal. Just letting you know. There are other arousals that are really good as well. And even, you know, sexual arousals that aren't perverted. Excellent. Just letting you all know, we're engaging our healthy mind, body, spirit here, right? Okay, so where were we? Where we were was... That's pretty good, actually. Uh, that was grammatically correct. Um, someone could argue it and probably be right. Not that much of an expert on it. Okay, so what's the title? What we're doing is we're still looking at the pill. And as I said, what I'm doing here and as we do in engaging a healthy mind, body, spirit, what do we do here? We read. We do a lot of reading here and then commenting. Part of the reason is because it just is impossible for me to fully get it on a PowerPoint and not miss something important, which comes from the first reading of it for me, right? And then that first reading gets my antenna up. Then I start making PowerPoints from the antenna and in, on this topic, I become overwhelmed. Lots of things to be thinking about as it relates to our expedition on pharmaceuticals, starting with the pill. Didn't read the, the next ones, although I do have a next one in mind. There was another one that came to mind today and I didn't write it down. Ah! But it does have to do with early, oh, I know where it came from. It came from our, I gotta write it down, our black history. So, last name is Percy, no, last name is Julian Lamont. Percy Julian Lamont. I got to get my pen. I, it's why I don't have a pen here. I know because I collected them and was writing all over the place this weekend. I was. I had two notebooks right here. <clears throat> and no pen. So you know I was doing a lot of writing. Highlighter, highlighter, black mark. There it is. Okay. So... I don't remember what he was looking up, but for engaging Percy Lamont Julian, he was, he worked on the pill as well. So, you can see that they are always creating a fall guy. Even Tuskegee is just got such a bad reputation and is inundated with black founders in names and history, right? So you always have to watch when a, a black person rises like a phoenix out of the ashes in a place where nobody else is succeeding, Booker T. You got to know what are the avenues that are helping him succeed because otherwise... Same thing with me. What are the avenues that are helping me succeed as well, right? Because uh, otherwise they would be gone. And that's, I know that that's the reason why people aren't around me because people who are around me are in danger. But um, if I can be kept safe, then I know that my husband knows who needs to be kept safe as well. They're like, they're narrowing in. <clears throat> they're narrowing in. We got to disappear. Three years. Then three years. Okay. I is itching and I'm putting something in it now, which happens to be hand lotion. 
Now I just put on. Okay. So let's get to reading now where we were. Isn't that cute though? You see, see the signature on there? Can you see? Cute. Most of you probably, you young people can't read it. It's script. Figure it out. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's nice though. All right, glasses are over there. Talk amongst yourselves about the pill. Which one? Okay, reconnected. So then there's usually a bump in it. There we go. And there's the bump. And all right, we're back. Okay, so that was a good time to like spew out for a minute and reconnect. I hope those adds to my episode so I'm almost in syndication then. Because we have, I put together 15 classrooms per week. So we're about 930. We're almost to our 1,000th classroom. How awesome is that? I think it's awesome. All right, so let's go here with our safari where we were reading and where we left off. So, what we're looking here at is we're still looking at Margaret Sanger's, this is from, I need to get this right too, because we haven't said it in a while, and I haven't looked at it in a while either, because I, I was really doing a lot of work though on this concept, the whole concept. Okay, I'm going to have to move back for a sec. Okay, so this is from The Pill, which, if you remember, was a PBS movie that I couldn't get, but I got the transcript for. So we're looking at the transcript and we're highlighting and we are discussing. And this is, oh, I said it was about Mar Margaret Sanger, didn't I? But it's not. But this is what we're reading, right? Which is a lot about Sanger. So here, we're getting, I don't even know, did we talk about this already or did I pass where we were? We did get to John Rock, right? All right, I'm seeing stuff. Oh. There we go, this is where we were. So now we're talking about the church position, which seems to be the greatest um, obstacle. It's really not the science. It's not the need or desire for it. It is the church. And the church even, you know, let me tell you something about the church. And in particular, the Catholic church. Uh-oh, she's going to lay it down. No, I'm not. You think I am, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to lay it down like you think I am. Okay, let me tell you something about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church holds on to, for the most part, 
A good Bible-based church, that's not a Catholic church, holds on to their most treasured interpretations of Scripture. And, they, and those then, they don't worry about the passage of time. And the Catholic Church is a great example of that. They don't worry about the passage of time and the passage of trends because God's word isn't trendy, right? It's not trendy. It surpasses all time. So if the tradition has it right, right, then... Based it, then it was based on scripture, and then they got the scripture right. But it gets into a lot of murky area when it comes to re, the fancy word reproductive rights, whether or not we should have a child who is not desired, right? Not that that child wouldn't be desired, not all kinds of things. It's just at the time, the pregnancy is undesirable. And as in my case, it's because that pregnancy was due to. Now, I don't know. It may not have been due to, but I did use contraception the first time, so it would not have worked. Turn out. He knew I was not having a baby from a rapist. And if he wanted that baby to be born, as I said in my prayers, you can figure out this is certainly not insurmountable. Right? Now that I'm not recommending that for everybody. I was young and I had no means. And I believed in my heart of hearts that that was done to prevent me from doing this today, right? That there was a there was a legion of pigs who didn't want me doing this today. I don't know. Because I, I don't know who the legion of pigs are. <laughs> Still to this day, I don't know. And, you know, I don't know. And I know that there are a lot of assumptions because the very first thing after that was somebody who said, this guy was accused of a rape, but it was somebody who looked just like him. It wasn't him. I'm like, maybe, maybe not. And then I met the guy. I'm like, okay. You know? <clears throat> People are trying to make me it, it, it look, you know, one way my whole life. And the advantage has been that I have cameras on me the, my whole life, right? People editing it, thinking that it's out there has changed things. But, but I know cameras have been on me my whole life. So the editing just makes you look guilty when you do that. That's the truth of the matter. Anyway. So I don't know. I'm not telling you. I would tell you to pray. Absolutely, I would tell you to pray and pray a lot, as I did. And there were a lot of things I prayed for. And I would not have, you know, I remember afterwards, I was just like, because during that time, I, I was like, in my mind, because I was drugged, stuck a needle in my ass, um, I remember in my mind, and I've said this before, I'm just going to shit all over them. Because uh, if I die, I wanted to die, right? Before I died, I was like, I want to shit all over them because they can't get that off of them. And it would they would just be so horrified by it. Well, I went into the bathroom after I woke up from this fest. And um, there was my underwear. And there was a piece of poop in my underwear. It was hard as a rock. I threw my underwear and the poop out the window. And that thanks, Sean Hayes, for that reminder. Honestly, I, I got it from you. I would not have known. But you see how the brain works. I mean, either that's a reminder or it's not. And that was a reminder. 
And it seems like the same window as in Ben Stiller's thing where he got the cock thing stuck. So what happened there? Hmm? I don't know. But anyway, it, it was very much like that window. Because I was able to open it, there were, and I could throw it out the window right there. So, and went, you know, without underwear, which is not my thing, and I can't even believe we're on. But this is engaging a healthy mind, body, spirit. So we talk about some very real things, right? So, I always knew people... In hindsight, I, I always knew people were trying to stop me from doing my thing. Always knew it. I thought they would stop me from having kids. They almost did, didn't they? I don't even know if those boys are mine. I don't even know if I have any children or not. I don't know. I don't know if I can even conceive. I don't know. I think there were assumptions made along the line of my about my pregnancy because nobody asked me in the family what happened not one person asked me so that meant every single one of them made an assumption every one of them made an assumption why wouldn't you ask what happened not one person asked me for the details so and in my mind I was like okay well that's God saying I guess you can either make a choice Annette you can make you said you don't want to make a deal out of it you've got a journey to do you can make a deal out of it, a big deal out of it, or you don't have to. But there were prayers all along the way, all along the way to help me deal with it. When you are in a helpless situation, and this actually is like really sound advice right now. When you're in a helpless situation, that's when I turn it over to God. Everyone's like, oh, you should be praying. And you should be praying all the time so that you build a relationship and so that you grow in his image so that when that torturous event happens, and it will be a torturous event that leaves you feeling helpless, like if you're raped. That's, that's, that is a system or a, a man or a system that wants to stop you from doing what you're doing. It's, it's a power thing. It, it's meant to leave you helpless, right? That's what it's meant to do. It's meant to leave you feeling like you have no choices, like you're helpless. Well, <clears throat> that's when I was able to forget it. Like there's nothing I can do about it so I could ruminate about it, go over the negative event in my mind over and over again when I have already been told I don't have the solution. It's not, the solution is not in my power. And there are no powers that appear to be helping me with the solution right now. Not a single person asked me what happened when I was pregnant. Not one person. You didn't ask me if I was seeing a guy. I was violently violated. And not a single person that knew about it, asked me what happened. And even later on, right? So there was a lot of assumptions. A lot of assumptions. I don't know. I don't know how long people have been mixing up eggs, so I don't even know. I do think I have children because I think I, somebody took the eggs, which I've said this before, right? So this whole thing appears to also be balanced on critical information that women just simply don't have. Like, are our eggs really, really rare? Like, if we, if we, if, are, are we just on high alert for real humans because we have been completely infiltrated by alien, you know, semen? I don't know. So, you, we can't assume that the people in power with all the money are just a bunch of, you know, foosball men waiting for you to hit them before they take a move. I don't think so. I think they're moving way before the law ever catches up with them. Right? 
They're not waiting for you to spin them around and tell them where to go to hit the ball. They're pretty much trying to turn you into the foosball guys. Do you like that analogy? I do. I think it's pretty good, actually. Foosball one. It's, it's got a little interesting twist, right? They're not foosball players, but they'd, they'd be happy if you were. Foosball guys. It crashed you. They're pretty sturdy, those foosball guys, though. It's hard to crush like that. Okay. So, now this stuff is festering, isn't it? All these rights, all this gender stuff and power struggles, all of it's festering beyond belief, isn't it? Who's Fester? Who even knows Fester is a name? Whose name is ever Fester? But if you had struggled with the teachings on contraception, then to have the church change its position is something with many more potential consequences. And again, it, is, it would be so convenient, honestly, it would be really convenient to throw your faith aside, wouldn't it? Right? Okay, Catholic Church changed. I guess I'm Catholic Church. Oh, but beliefs are deep-rooted. They're deep-rooted. They're deep-rooted here. Remember, uh, we're talking in DIY about creating heart beliefs about creating these deep-rooted heart beliefs. That's what we've created. So to call it a religion is, is dogma, right, Sam Harris? To call it a that the, the problem is religion is dogma. You say dogma is deep-rooted. That's more than dogma. Dogma's here. Heart beliefs, I, I get you. Maybe you like it. You know, it's a meditative kind of... Um, yeah, how come you don't know anything, Sam Harris, about the cognitive neuroscience of meditation? Because you never talk about it. You just sound like a blogger. A smart one. One who's read a lot, but not one who has a real PhD in cognitive neuroscience from Harvard. Unless they're giving them out, out like, you know. Well, oh, let's not go in the gutter. For those of you who heard the thought, so really great consequences when the beliefs are not superficial, but when the beliefs are heart beliefs based on my salvation. And this is the tricky part. This is when the powers that be say, get rid of that effing belief system that they have about salvation because if they believe that the moral choice that their salvation is dependent on a moral choice then it doesn't really matter what the church changes we gotta we gotta have a little stick to and that's what they had <clears throat> yeah. by 1965 more than six million women were taking the pill six million women I'm sorry, when did it come out again? May 11th, uh, right around um, Mother's Day, if you remember, right? May 11th, 1960. I think that's my, I, I think May 12th is my sister's anniversary, which is a little funny, like ironic funny, right? But that's only because I've been talking about these mixed up genes and stuff, right? And her husband was there since the beginning of all this. Since we were like 15, 16 years old. He was, she was. But if you had struggled with, all right, we already read that. So 6 million women were taking the pill. American society was beginning to change. I want that one to be purple now. There we go. Exactly. The facts I do in, um, the facts I do in purple, like, but the narrative I, I do in yellow. 
It changed from nice girls don't do it. Well, you know what? Nice girls are questioning a lot of things about what nice girls do and don't do. And that was a huge awakening. I really felt as though I could have it all. You know, I could be a sexual being. I could be a nice girl. I could be a girl with a future. That was me right there. That explained me. I was that person. And this is the... um. What are we? Aren't we Gen Xers? Then it was the millennials, then Gen Zs. I don't know. 1965. So I, I right, I'm after the baby boomers. I forgot what's next. How could I forget? I don't even know. I, th I thought we were Gen Xers. I thought it was Gen X. But not, and my kids are millennials. Uh, but that's what I wanted. Whatever, whatever gen, you know, stereotype I fit into, what I wanted was to be a sexual being, a nice girl, right? Just exactly what you want. You just a nice girl next door. Who's not afraid. Who's not frigid and give me a future. I could, so I could be independent. I don't have to depend on that guy who's on a, on a effing power trip. You began to expect something that would be 100% reliable. And what that meant was really a change towards what people in the business call a contraceptive mentality, a mentality that it was absolutely to be expected that people plan their reproductive lives. Women became lawyers because law firms no longer had to worry that women, that the woman was going to get pregnant in the middle of a big case. Women became doctors because they could space their children so that they had time to do their internships and residencies. Women went to work. When women started doing this, it was just like, wow, it was truly a wow. How do they have enough courage? And they don't seem to be concerned when, whether they have a guy or not. They don't seem to be concerned whether, whether they have an MRS degree or not. And it was, it was revolutionary to me, me with five children. But for all the enthusiasm sweeping the country, one group viewed the pill with great suspicion. At that time, there were concerns in the black community that family planning, especially family planning clinics dominated by whites, were a form of racial genocide. That was, that was my experience. In fact, sterilization abuse was so rampant in the South that blacks called it a Mississippi appendectomy. So it was commonly known that black women were being pressured into sterilization or even sterilized without their knowledge. If I was sterilized and there was a good chance I was, it was without my knowledge. And it was due to the erroneous conclusion, I'll just tell you, because it was erroneous that my dad was the father. Yeah. Yeah. He was not. He, he was not the father. He had nothing to do, you know, as far as I know, with sticking a needle in my ass. But, you know, his workers could have. Those, it was clear, it was clear, those kids in Fremont High School, Phil Chrysler in particular, who spelled Chrysler in particular, him. He had a nasty, nasty heart on for me. And then those Tannises too, those Tannises, Mrs. Tannis, who worked in the, in the secretary pool, and Jerry Tannis. Jerry Tannis was nasty, nasty. And that just keeps coming up in my memory as well. And they, they were twins or triplets even. There might have even been triplets. So I don't even know what it's so weird stuff. But... I remember at the bonfire on the homecoming, when we were supposed to attend homecoming, they dumped us out of the car. They dumped us out of the car and went back home. Jill Berger and me, they dumped. And then Mrs. Tana said, you're not supposed to be here drunk. And I told her, and I went back in the office the next day and I said, I, we had to, what are you doing about it? We had to have been drugged. None of us were drinking. By the way, Frank Gerber had his hands in my pants and told me he was taking my eggs. So what are you doing about it, Mrs. Tannis? You know what she did about it? Nothing. You know whose face 
was a psychologist that came with my son and me, Penny Tannis, Ed's psych degree. You can get those online without a whole lot of education or performance. So, when we are talking about reproductive rights, there is the surface that we see Catholics that are trying to dictate certain things based on heart's beliefs, but reasoning underneath that that none of us see what's going on, right? Sterilization. My last name was Garcia, and I was hated when I got to that community. Mexicans were hated in that community. Hated. And farms were built on the backs of Mexicans in Fremont. Big ag. Check out Vogel Ag. Absolutely illegal aliens. He said he can't work without them. Why? Because the price of their poisoned seed costs too much. Hmm, what a shame. I'm sorry, how much were you making on the fields that you were that were dirt and you couldn't do anything with when you put on the the um all of the solar panels? 90,000 was one of the paychecks. That's what you told me. You can't afford to pay cuz cuz my 5 month unemployment is probably about one tenth. That's all that they have to pay me of what the president makes in a year, if that, might be, might be, one one, what would it be, one twentieth. Yeah, maybe one twentieth, probably one twentieth of what the president makes. Total, like my total five months. That the oh, by the way, that they that they're trying not to pay me, that they're that they're working to not pay me. If they pay me. Then there's evidence I'm still around. Oh, maybe I better check, cash that check, huh? Then there's evidence I'm still around. Ooh. Because you're all trying to get rid of the evidence that I was ever here. So you can go about your dirty business. Stop it. I'm doing something good for everybody. You dirty, filthy pigs over here. Make me want to vomit. Blech. So corrupt and immoral. So that's a system going on underneath here that makes me want to just retch. It's that bad. It's, it's so bad. Okay. So it wasn't just black people were getting sterilized. Although at this time, that, prop, that certainly was... The emphasis. Also remember that the, the hoods of the KKK were trying to stir up the spirits of the Confederates in the minds of black people who had a spiritual, a strong spiritual foundation that the whites did not have. Militant black power groups declared birth control the equivalent of black genocide and implored black women to throw away their pills. Black women did respond by saying that they understood the reasons for their concerns, but that black women had to make decisions for themselves. And in the end, black women decided to use the pill in equal numbers as whites. In the autumn of 1966, Margaret Sanger died at the age of 87. She had lived long enough to see her dream fulfilled and her despised Comstock laws overturned. Her scientist, Gregory Pincus, died a year later from overexposure to toxic chemicals in the lab. That's interesting. What toxic chemicals? What were you working on with toxic chemicals? Her angel, Catherine McCormick, would die next at 92. That's pretty old, so not too bad, McCormick. Only her Catholic doctor, John Rock, would live to see the pill's full impact on American society. Mm, lucky you, John. Geraldine, mother really. For a modern look at sex, take cut title card for film, Prudence and the Pill. Only a generation earlier, birth control had been unmentionable in public. In 1968, the pill was the star of a Hollywood film. 
Of all the mean, vile, deceitful, treacherous, sneaky tricks, someone switched the pills with the aspirins. Ah! Social commentators called it a sexual revolution. Here was a tool that permitted sexual expression that simply hadn't occurred before, except in very small communities of bohemians. Of course, this was the golden age when venereal disease was assumed to be to be conquered and no one had ever heard of AIDS. Ah, but I think some of that bravado, maybe much of that bravado was linked to the pill and this confidence that nothing could go wrong, which the media was selling as well, by the way. On July 25th, 1968, Pope Paul VI issued an encyclical called Human Vita of Human Life the church's final pronouncement on the pill. The answer from Paul VI is no, not only no, but absolutely no, reaffirming the absolute prohibition against any, quote, artificial, unquote, form of contraception. Uh, hum humana Vida actually speaks of marriage in lyrical terms. It's a view of sex that respects the human person that sees the context of which sex occurs as crucial, which regards love as an absolute essential part of sexual expression. But of course, it confines, confines sex to marriage and it does continue this absolutely essential link to procreation. It's an essential, essential link, but we need to be able to have control over it too, for Pete's sake. Rock could barely contain his disappointment with the Vatican's decision. The hierarchy has made a terrible mistake, was all he could say. John Rock is devastated. John Rock finds it hard, really very hard, to believe that his church could act what he saw as so unwisely. John is now moving into his 80s. He really knows that there's not going to be another battle. John Rock would grow distant from the church. He died in 1984 at the age of 94. In the wake, it, in the wake if, of the encyclical, I think, millions of Catholic women would defy church teachings on contraception, using the pill in equal numbers as non-Catholics. Yeah, yeah, except for then they... they wouldn't have the abortion, so they'd break the law here, but now with the abortions, because that was murder, but then they would leave them in bathrooms and bathtubs and, and, and be psychosomatic about their pregnancies. By the late 1960s, thousands of women were complaining to their physicians about side effects, the same problems discounted by Pincus and Rock in Puerto Rico. I began ha to have cluster migraines, really, really evil headaches. And I asked my physician on a couple of occasions to take me off the pill and to start, you know, help me get some other type of birth control going. And I allowed him to talk me out of it on both occasions. Nice job, you male physician asshole. Barbara Seaman. The motto was, don't worry your pretty little head about it to the female patient. Let doctor do the worrying for you, which is exactly what I had from my doctor at St. Mary's Hospital. Don't worry your pretty little head about uh, your, your um, ovulation. You don't need to worry about those pains of ovulation. That was at a time, which I didn't, but whatever. That was at a time when a male gynecologist dominated women patients without question. We were father figures. We were taught to be father figures. We were taught to be father figures. We were taught never to be questioned. Our judgment about all matters reproductive were never to be questioned. And we talked about this in Bookless Classroom. And in the 1900s, it was the idea of male superiority. It was just not questioned. Male su superiority was scientific if you asked them in the early 1900s. And how that could be is, you know, whatever. Doctors were relying on the drug companies and FDA for information, and both had given assurances that the pill was safe. The doctor was blind, the patient was blind, and the doctor was deaf and dumb, too. You had 15 million women that weren't ill to start with, and you gave them a pill, and now they were ill. Not all of them, but some of them. And that was a new ball game. Earlier, during the Puerto Rico study, three women had died while participating in the trial. They were never autopsied, and the cause of death remained unknown. See, these are, this is where, and on our slide, we're talking about the Puerto Rico studies, right? So, now grim news began to filter through the medical community. The pill could kill. 
I got up one morning to go to work and I was having one of these headaches, except this time I had kind of a strange black film over my vision in my right eye and just was terribly ill. I can't even, I cannot describe the feeling. It was like a wave of fear, I guess, that kind of washed up over me. The nurses took my blood pressure, at which point everyone's attitude changed. And you know when you see medical people react like that to you, they go from casual to get the doctor now and everybody's running around looking kind of freaked out. Um, it makes an impression. Uh, the upshot was they were guessing that I was having a stroke, that I was in fact the diagnosis. That was in fact the diagnosis. I remember reading about that some woman died, they had a stroke, but I wanted to believe so much that it wasn't the birth control pill, that it was like they probably did something else. You know, it couldn't have been it couldn't just been the birth control pill because I still believed they would not give you something that harmed you. In 1969, a hard-hitting expose which would shake the medical community out of its complacency. We were snookered. We were told that we were given this wonderful gift by modern science that would make our lives so much better. But there was a very dark side and the dark side was concealed and denied. It was denied. And a lot of healthy young women died or were left crippled. We can't ignore that. Seaman's book caught the attention of the U.S. Senator Gaylord Nelson, who moved rapidly to set up hearings. In January 1970, experts were summoned to Washington. Only men were invited to testify. Now, go to our bookless classroom. That sounds like the 1850s. Honest to God, no, no exaggeration. It sounds like the 1850s. Here was I, old Phil Ball, just a plain old doctor from Muncie, Indiana, and we go to the nation's capital, and there we go to the hearings, find our way to the Senate room, and it was an enormous room full of people. And I simply told them that I was in practice and that I was suddenly afflicted with all these young women taking the pill that had all these problems. Even though I have not prescribed the medication in some years, a procession of symptomatically unhappy women taking birth control pill, pills continues to flow into my office. Mind you, this, mind you this, the dose of the pill in those days was 10 times what it is now. It was a huge blockbuster pill. They used a sludge, sledgehammer to, to drive a small nail. You know, it was it was an unnecessary dose. Sitting in the Senate chamber that day was a group of young feminists who themselves had taken the pill. We began to hear researcher after researcher, male after male, start saying things about the pill. And then one doctor, I believe, said fertilizer is to wheat what estrogen is to cancer. And I think at that point, we practically dropped dead. We were so shocked. Why had you assured the drug companies that they could testify? Why have you told them that they could go get top priority? They're not taking the pills. We are. Who is going to pay the medical bills when a woman develops cancer of the breast and cancer of the uterus? And, and it just just all seems so outrageous to us that we were not given any information when we were given the pill. It was literally handed out like candy. We are not just going to sit quietly any longer. You are murdering us for your profit and convenience. We are not going to permit the proceedings to be interrupted in this way. If you ladies would uh, sit down. Our lives have been disrupted by taking this pill. Uh, Senator Nelson, we're conducting, I don't think the hearings are any more important than our lives. Senator Nelson, can we have some solid answers for our questions or not? Why did you do this? This is a really unfair trick. Why did you do this? Why didn't you answer our questions? Well, first they ignored us, but then all the television cameras turned on us. And once we saw the television cameras, we asked more questions and they adjourned the hearings. Ah, will everybody please leave the room, press, and everyone else. The young women had captured the national spotlight. It must be admitted that women make superb guinea pigs. They don't cost anything. They feed themselves. They clean their own cages, pay for their own pills, and room, room, renumer, re, I think it's renumerate, remunerate. I don't know that word remunerate the the clinical the clinical 
observer. I think what they're saying is that they take away any obligation of the clinical observer. We will no longer tolerate intimidation by white-coated gods antiseptically directing our lies. They came back day after day, and that became the story. The disruptions at the hearing. It was the Boston Tea Party of the women's health movement. What came out of the hearings was for women to have much more control over our own bodies. As a result, the protests, hormone levels in the pill were slashed, greatly diminishing the occurrence of side effects. Manufacturers re were required to include information in every package listing potential risks, and women demanded a new kind of relationship with their doctors. The bad patient, she'd walk in pregnant with the husband, and here are my demands. That was the phenomenon of the 70s. I won't have this. I will have... I will have that. I won't have this. And they got this from the same medical political activist that I was. And it was terrifying to me to hear myself give a lecture to a lay group about why they shouldn't let doctors do all these things to them and know those same damn patients came back to my office and made those demands of me and used it to upset the hell out of me. The pill would help launch a generation of activists, not only in the doctor's office, but in the streets, in the bedroom, in society. The pill did more for the equality of women than any other single factor, certainly in the 20th century. Women began to see themselves for the first time in all of history as economically self-sustainable units. And that, I think, was one of the most profound changes. It's an estimated 80% of all American women born since 1945 have taken the pill. You cannot understand modern women's history without thinking about the pill, about what the pill did for women and also what the pill did to women. How about that? How about that? Women began to see themselves for the first time in all history as economically sustainable, self-sustainable units. And the thing about that, even though we're at 1210, is that we saw what we had assumed to be evolved traits in women different than men become more masculine in their desire for more physically attractive men. When women become eco more economically independent, they begin to have similar values in their mate as men do, which is they need to be physically appealing. If I have to depend on them for money, I'll take a piece of shit. I won't. That's what I'm teaching you. This is Dr. Anna Fairovich, and this is how we get a healthier mind a healthier body, and a healthier spirit by engaging in this classroom, the mind and then the heart. Or the heart first and then the mind. I don't even know which one comes first. It's like a chicken or egg, but that's disgusting. We're not animals, right? We're talking mind and heart. We're not animals, you know, not in the sense that they like us to believe that we're animals sitting over there only wanting to screw our partner every second of the day. Dr. Anna Perovich, thanks for engaging.